that was me for nine years. I was a speechwriter for the EPA during the day and then stand-up comic at night. All right. So here we go. So you started moonlighting as a comedian at the ripe old age of what? 24. 24. When do most comedians start getting in front of people? One thing I believe very firmly is that nobody's funny until 25. That's a pretty good rule. You can you sometimes see people who are younger than that, and you can kind of tell they're going to be funny. But they're not they're funny older. yet. They're maybe not funny yet. And they're not funny yet because? No life experience. Interesting. No perspective. Their brains aren't developed. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, they're not good at anything. <laughs> they're in their early 20s. I mean. For all the young people listening to this, there's hope for you. <laughs> Did I just shit on half your audience? Like, your audience is like 19, and I'm like, their brains don't work. This week on Forward, veteran stand-up comedian, TV writer for John Oliver until recently, he's got a new gig now, and the blogger for the, the political comedy blog, which is right up our alley, I Might Be Wrong, Jeff Maurer. Welcome, Jeff. Thanks a lot for having me. Thank you. So, freaking stand-up comedian for 18 <laughs> years out of D.C., uh, but you were a speechwriter by day for the EPA, which is very, very serious stuff. Yeah. Um, so were you like Batman where it was like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like, was it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, if, uh, if Batman peaks at being a, you know, middling stand-up comic, uh, in B rooms throughout the Midwest. Yeah. Kind of like that. But yes, yeah, so that's the idea. I always had to change the clothes in my drawer at work and then had to change into my stand-up comedy clothes and go do a gig at night. But you mean you had, to, you had to change into this uniform we see? <laughs> exactly. The, the nice, the casual. You don't want to be too good looking. You don't want to be too, like, together. You can't wear a suit. Well, some people can pull off a suit. But generally, you want to be, like, casual on stage. So I, I got to say, check it out. If I went to a comedy club and some dude showed up in a suit from their very officious day job at mm -hmm. the EPA or whatever, I'd be like, this dude's not funny at all. Yeah, you'd be like, I came here to relax. What's the, I didn't come here to see Brooks my, my boss asshole. and what? my yeah, report. Exactly, yeah. Um, so you went to Georgetown, which produced a, a lot of world-class comics, right? I mean, mm -hmm. like, uh, I, I think of... When I think me Georgetown. first among them, but yeah, yeah it says the, in the pantheon. It starts with me. The Mount Rushmore. But I'm not the only one. It's Jeff Maurer. <laughs> uh, yeah, who else? Jim Gaffigan, John Mulaney, and Nick Kroll. John Mulaney and Nick Kroll were there at the same time. They were they were there when I was there. Mike Birbiglia. Oh um, wow, it's a lot. Jackie, Shit, I forgot Jackie about. Novak. Uh, yeah, about Birbiglia for a second. And, and, Sorry, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, well, yeah, and Mike was kind of Mike was a little ahead of Mulaney and Kroll. So Mike started an improv troupe that Mulaney and Kroll were in when I was there. And I would go to the improv shows and I'd be like, this is, this is hilarious. And it kind of spoiled me for improv forever because I thought like improv's great. And I didn't realize, yeah, improv is great when fucking John Mulaney and Nick Kroll are in <laughs> the improv troupe. And otherwise that's, like, usually not, that's usually not the case. Yeah, and, and it's, it's usually terrible. Yeah, because those guys are usually not in the troupe. But uh, yeah, at the time I was like, oh man, this is fucking funny. Wow. So were you bitten by the comedy bug at that point? You went to grad school afterwards, so I guess it, yeah. the, the bug didn't get you that bad yet. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. No, well, and also, like, well before that, I mean, I was just, you know, we got Comedy Central in my house in 1989 when I was nine years old, and I just, you know, watched Comedy Central constantly. So, like, I loved stand-up, because that's all Comedy Central was back then, was stand-up and mystery science theater. So I loved stand-up. And always wanted to do it, but like I'm not really, I'm not a theater kid. I'm not an extrovert, so it took me 24 years to get up there and actually try it. Wow. Yeah. That's so interesting. <laughs> Whoa. Uh, so after Georgetown, you went to grad school for polit politics and economics, yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Wow, you're very learned. <laughs> well, thanks. <laughs> is, is well, thanks. Enough? I'm glad I could uh, wave my degrees around. That's what I came here to do. That's what people want from their <laughs> comedians, too. They want business suits and advanced degrees. Wait, wait, wait. Before we start, do you have a master's degree from an accredited institution? Because other than and that, you, in, you are not qualified to make me laugh. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Oh, you're all but dissertation? Go fuck yourself. We don't want to hear from you then. Shit, man, you finished a dissertation? <laughs> no, I didn't. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. And that's why that's why I, I, I'm not very famous as a comedian. I, I, I uh, no, all the famous only have a master's have degree. PhDs. They've all got PhDs. Every last one of them. Yes. Often multiple PhDs. How else would you become a comedian? And then uh, you 
did the Peace Corps, but it was abbreviated because of security problems, all right? Yeah, yeah. It was So this was Morocco in 2004. We were the first group back in, in Morocco in 2004. And there is, I mean, there's a very long story, but it's just, uh, there's a problem with the homestay. I was married at the time. Holy shit. I'm married now, but to a different lady. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and it was like the homestay was no good. And they're like, do you, they, they said, like, do you want to, uh, like, re-up or go back? And I'm like, go go back. Because it was no good. So does that mean you could say, like, hey, I was in the Peace Corps? Um, and it was like, I mean, because that's totally legit. You were in the Peace Corps. I was in the Peace Corps. I don't get the civil service points for it. Oh, that's cool. Because I didn't uh, finish. So then you came back and um, became a speechwriter for the EPA. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, I was a spe- so that was that was me for nine years. I was a speechwriter for the EPA during the day, and then stand up comic at night. All right, so here we go. So you started moonlighting as a comedian at the ripe old age of what? Twenty four. Twenty four, which is um, not old, clearly, but uh, not young, I suppose. In in comic, Jesus, what? if that's not young, I mean, I'm forty two now. But no, but but <laughs> twenty four is not young. <laughs> I mean, it's young in absolute terms, but I was wondering, when do most comedians start getting in front of people? One thing I believe very firmly is that nobody's funny until 25. That's a pretty good rule. You can, you sometimes see people who are younger than that, and you can kind of tell they're going to be funny but they're when not they're funny older. Yet. They're maybe not funny yet. And they're not funny yet because? No life experience. Interesting. No perspective. Their brains aren't developed. Exactly, yeah. I mean, they're not good at anything. <laughs> they're in their early 20s. I mean. For all the young people listening to this, there's hope for you. <laughs> you get to 25 and then you can just did be I, like, hey, am I fucking funny now? Did I just shit on half your audience? Like, your audience is like 19 and I'm like, their brains don't work. No, <laughs> it's an objective fact. Their brain's not done forming yet. Yeah, so there's hope. Hope hope for the, the, right. the youngs. Um, so you're like, hey, I'm in, I'm in front of audi- uh, audiences right in the nick of time because I'm about to become funny next <laughs> That's year. True. That's true. I would end every set going, well, all right, that wasn't very good, but come back in a year. So your colleagues at the EPA know you're a comedian at night, obviously, because you can't yes. hide that shit for like nine, nine Correct. years. Correct. Yeah, no, no way. Right. The other comedians, how many of them had normal day jobs like you? Where I was in D.C., all of them, all of them, which I think made for a much healthier scene. I, th- I think people don't realize that, like, D.C. is a very good stand-up scene. A-, a lot of second cities, you know, D.C., Boston, Denver, Seattle, these are really good stand-up cities. And I think one of the reasons, I mean, the first reason is obviously, like, the club-to-comic ratio is pretty good, whereas in New York and L.A., there are just a billion comics, and it's really hard to get stage time. You want to start in a second city and then move to a bigger city when you have a bit of a name. When you have a name you can tread on, everyone wants to book you. But before that, and you're just trying to prove that you're funny, it's just really, it's really hard to get that critical mass going. And you can't get good without stage time, and then you can't get stage time because you're not any good. So it's really a lot better to start in a medium-sized city. So this is some very, very practical advice for my listeners mm-hmm. who want to get into comedy, and there are some, for okay. sure. Sure. So Jeff Maurer says, look, cut your teeth in a city that has a scene but is not necessarily like the New York or LA because yeah. you get more stage time, more reps, uh, maybe like people are are like less of assholes to you. I don't know if that's true. But say there, there are there are more scammers in New York and LA who will do these shows that are like, bring 20 people with you. Sure. And they always promise like, yeah, and the club owner's gonna be there and we're gonna we're gonna, you know, spot talent. Like that doesn't happen. They just want you to bring 20 people to their show. So those people exist in New York and L.A. And also, the other thing that happens in Second City is very few people are, like, trying to make it. There's so many, like, aggressive hustlers in New York and L.A. It can get pretty annoying. There are people who are in comedy, and the only thing they're good at is promoting their career. (laughs) They're not good at comedy. They're good at promoting themselves. So what does that progression look like for a fledgling comedian? And then when's, like, when's the benchmark where you're like, okay, now I'm, like, you know... Like a, what, quote unquote, like a real comedian, I'm, because I'm yeah. sure you didn't feel like a real comedian. You're exactly right that there's like a dividing line. For me, it's when I quit my day job. Wow, when was that? Holy shit. That was 2014 when John Oliver hired me. And before that, I was, I, before that I would say I'm a guy who does comedy. Okay. Because I, I had mean, a day job. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, you're not a professional. Yeah, that's, that's how I saw it. Um, and the progression goes like this. You start out doing like the shittiest shows imaginable. I mean, you go to open mics. And there's nobody there except the other comics and then crazy people because 
who would come to an open mic. Sounds a little like politics. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> are you, though? I, I, don't, I? I don't think you are good. Am I? Like, when did you start getting paid, like, <laughs> 100 bucks or something like that? In my town, the A-Club was the DC Improv. Feature of the DC Improv is, funny you should say that, exactly 100 bucks. Or at least it was back then. It's probably more now. Like big money, <laughs> you go yeah. there and it's like still hundred. It's for, well, <laughs> like supply and demand. It could be seventy five now. I don't know, um, but yeah, that felt and that felt like real money because you'll do a weekend. It'll be like seven shows, seven hundred bucks. Hell yes. When I'm yeah, that's like that, twenty seven. That that's that great. Feels, that feels real for sure. Yeah, yeah. Eventually, I got to the point where I could submit packets for stuff. Right. It's like people were kind of aware of me, especially I moved to New York in uh, late twenty eleven, early twenty twelve. And I got to submit packets for shows. So I put in a packet for like every terrible show, like a thousand shows that were like very quickly canceled. And like I would have been thrilled to have gotten them. So it's funny that the one that I eventually got was last week tonight with John Oliver that, you know, like stuck on the air and was around. So you get that gig and you're like, I mean, that must feel also like a made man. You're like, oh shit, I'm a TV writer. Yeah. Like legit. Yeah. HBO hit. Like I said, that's when I, I quit my day job, and um, when people said, what do you do? I say, comedian, instead of, I'm a speechwriter and I also do comedy. So when you were a TV writer for John Oliver, you you still just show up and do clubs and sets all the, the long day, is that right? Yeah, and, and that's, when it, that's when it got easier for me. Like, that's when the comedy seller started taking me. You know, that's when Caroline's gave a shit about me, because now I've got a halfway decent credit. Which is important to them. Like they need to, they need to impress their audience a little they bit. Need when they bill. It's like, hey, from, from the John Oliver writing room. I, <laughs> I always hated. Sometimes an MC who didn't know anything would say, "You saw him on last week tonight with John Oliver." I'm like, you did not see me <laughs> on last week tonight. Nobody's on that show but John Oliver. Is your set actually political? Because your blog goes into politics a great deal. And you do have an advanced degree, as we have established. Yeah, the advanced degree that all comedians have, yes. Yes. Uh, <laughs> it's funny. My, you're right. My work on John Oliver was political. Yeah. My blog is almost all political comedy. My stand-up was not political co comedy <laughs> at all. <laughs> That's funny. Wait, not at all. Uh, no. I'll tell you why, though. Yeah, it's it's because you lose the audience so quickly. Oh, my god. When you do political stuff. Because you're doing... It's like... When you say, all right, let's talk about politics. Oh. Exactly. Get on stage. We it, hate you. Yes, yes. If they weren't already saying that, and they often were. But, like, immediately you you lose half your audience because they're like, we don't, I just don't follow politics. Fascinating. Okay, wait, wait. Let's review this argument. Um, I, I'm, I'm thinking of other comedians who do politics, and I can't really think of that many. Uh, it's, it's a small number these days. It's like Bill Maher, who, you know, there are some, there are people who are, like, grandfathered in because, you know, they were, they've been around forever. Or, like, certainly their audience shows up knowing they're going to get... John Stewart, I suppose. Sure, John Stewart, but yes. But John Stewart's audience, you know, when he does stand-up now, they know... What they're getting. What they're getting. Yeah. you got to remember, like, when you're being brought up as, hey, here's yet another one. Like, that's basically your intro. So what, <laughs> so what did your comedy focus on? I talked a lot about working in an office. It has to be relatable stuff, so right? So it's like Mike Judge office space type stuff? That's fun. A lot of that, yeah. A lot of that, because... People relate to that. Yeah, sure. Yeah, and this is why politics doesn't work. It's like people, a lot of people don't relate to it. You, you divide the audience once when you say, because half of them don't care. So you say, I'm talking about politics. You lose half of them. And then you're about to lose half of the half that you have when you have any kind of viewpoint. Because if, if I reveal that I'm liberal, then I'm going to lose the conservatives. Just lost this podcast, man. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you're down to 20, 25% of 25. No, I'm just kidding. I'm a heterodox um, liberal. That's why you had me on. No, no, yeah, no, it, no he, he, he is very, very heterodox and thoughtful. <laughs> that, 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 that's true. So what's the process in terms of uh, subjects for John Oliver? Um, because it's like the, there's like a topic that you dig into, obviously very political, smart. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a fan. I was a fan of the show. Oh, thanks. Um, so, well, now you lost your audience by... <laughs> Oh, well, yeah, I guess so. If, yeah, you know. Uh, sorry, if guys. If they're allergic to the term liberal, certainly they'll also be allergic to uh, John Oliver specifically. Like, how many writers mm -hmm. were there in the room? Eight for most of the time I was there, though by the time I left it was ten. Um, a lot. It's more than that now. I think they're like 12 or 14 now. Wow. All four. What? It's like half an hour TV, right? Yeah. Wow. No, the, the other shows hate us. Because they're like, so you do half an hour a week, and Colbert does, you know... Five hours a week, but of course, you know a lot of that's like guests and musical sure. guests and ads and stuff. But still, like the, we, yes, it is a um, it is a reduced schedule compared to them. But it, <laughs> we we always find ways to fill the time. It's like it's a busy week. 
I wasn't like kicking off at four o'clock, you know, we always had <laughs> shit to do. And uh, it's a def- dense half hour. It's a dense, there's a lot in that half hour. But to, you, you asked, and I didn't answer, uh, like what the process for coming up with topics. The topics get pitched by the writers and then also the researchers. And the you had researchers on top of the ten writers. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, then you start a show. <laughs> if you're certain you can do it with a skeleton well, crew, thinking of about four it. people, and then thinking deeply you're gonna, you're, about it, Jeff. You, you right. take it like a consultant's view of uh, comedy. Like you, I, you a lot of All right, dead so the ten writers are how many? Re- <laughs> how many researchers? Uh, started with they kept growing. It started with three, then it was four, then it was five. Wow. And then four footage producers. Wow, can't forget about the footage producers. No, but but everybody pitches. Everybody pitches, so it could come from anywhere. So was there anything that you were like, hey, my fingerprints all over that stuff, and I was really proud of, and you'd, you'd call someone and be like, yo, this 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 one was all me. Well, there are ones you're assigned to, so every piece has usually two lead writers. If it's a bigger one, it might be four, but it's usually two. So yes, you're assigned to those, and at the end, everyone gets brought in. So everyone's involved with every piece in a way. Um, but there are the ones you're assigned to. Those are definitely yours. And then sometimes you do kind of pitch one, and then it gets on. Yeah, there are some. I mean, like a lot of the environmental stuff, because I had worked at the EPA for nine years. Oh shit! Yeah, they would bust you out on all the, the environmental yes, stuff. They, yeah, so and be like, hey man, you're Mr. Environment, right? You know, tell Pretty us much. What, what's going on. Yeah, it, you know. So was there like Mr. Foreign Policy? Were they <laughs> they're like they're different dudes? We did kind of get lanes. I I, th- I feel like I was also maybe Mr. Foreign Policy because I did like I did Iran deal. I did North Korea, international trade was one I did because again that's kind of my wheelhouse. Um, but yeah, people had different. Uh, we had a couple people who knew a lot about like news media because they had worked in that previously. So those pieces came from them. Interesting. Uh, my uh, office mate Jill Twist did a lot of the stuff on like women's rights and things like that. Life can be overwhelming. We all know this. Often we burn out without even realizing it. So that can end up being lack of motivation or irritability or fatigue or just shortness, things like that. And I want to talk to you guys about BetterHelp because it is a type of online therapy that wants to remind you to prioritize yourself and helps you just kind of work through your thoughts. Personally, I use BetterHelp, use it a lot during COVID, but just to, I called it my steam valve, just to blow off some steam, just to collect my thoughts, talk about things I don't necessarily want to talk about publicly with someone online, securely, privately, personally. So BetterHelp if you don't know, is a customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist. So you don't have to see anyone on camera, even if you don't want to. It's private, secure, it's convenient, easy to schedule. It's awesome. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy. And you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. So really, really easy to start. So listen, our listeners of Forward Podcast are going to get 10% off their first month. That's betterhelp.com slash yang. So check it out. That's better, H-E-L-P dot com slash Yang. Take care of your head, guys. Check it out right now, betterhelp.com slash Yang. So there's this this notion of uh, Hollywood liberal elites, like New York cultural elites, like we're the, um, the political leanings of the the writers like relatively uniform heterodox like all over the place uh uh when i you know the, so the original writing staff the original eight i would say we were kind of like eight obama era liberals you're just not going to get many conservatives in this field it's like think about who you're drawing from right it's like okay first they're almost all comedy writers are highly educated you know they almost certainly went to college. I, I honestly, I'm not sure I know a comedy writer. I know tons of stand-ups, but a comedy writer who didn't go to college, I don't think I know a single one. Interesting. And almost always like a fancy pants college, sure. right? Um, and then they live in a city. They're almost certainly young. They probably, these days, I, I came up through stand-up, that's a little odd these days. More commonly these days, they would have come from improv. The improv, if you ever hang around, you know, we're in New York. Second City in New York, like, that's a really far left kind of click. 
Um, so like these are the demographics you're drawing from. There are just not a lot of conservatives in that pool. So oh, makes perfect sense. Yeah. So you're uh, so uh, your writings are, are endlessly entertaining. So I urge everyone to Thank check you. it out. At I might be wrong. Uh, and I, I would see you as, well, I mean, you, you say in your blog that, you know, like you were uh, like at a certain point and then there was this notion that the sides ran off to, uh, like, you know, ran off to the extremes yeah. and like you might have drifted a particular direction. Um, but there was one of your recent blog posts that I thought was really funny, which was um, like you characterized the, the left not as like left and extreme left it's like there's like the left and people who believe in various policies like let's say climate change which you know in my mind like people i think people know that like i, I think that's a near existential threat or existential kind of a big threat thing. yeah, yeah kind of and i'd agree thing. with it's you gonna, on that yeah. it's, it's a big thing um, um but then you characterize folks on the uh, the the extreme left as sort of like they're not extreme left anymore they're something else yeah yeah well that, yeah that that's uh that is how i feel i do feel that um we don't have a name for this, you know. Oh, no. Did Wokeism, you... progressive, super progressivism. Yeah. Whatever so you, you said that there were it. a few different, like Wesley Yang called them what? The the successor ideology, and then I say religious left, because I'm from a part of the South that's pretty religious. Oh, what what part of the South are you from? Norfolk area, in my town in Great Bridge, Virginia. It's it's pretty. It's a pretty conservative area, or at least certainly was. You know, a ton of the people that I'm aligned with in the Ford Party are like are are, are like exposed to religious communities, and they're, they're yeah. just like anyway. Well, that that sounds like me as well. It was a, my my family oddly was like the one family that was like not all that religious, but very religious area that really made an impression on me, and that's why I often refer to what's happening now as the religious left because they very much remind me of those people I knew when I was younger, and that they have they have you know these beliefs that they adhere to you know, in my mind, past the point of all logic. And that's what I was getting at uh, in the piece you're referring to. It's called The Great Dumbening on my Substack. I might be wrong. And I, I, because I, I still consider myself a liberal and I sure. consider myself on the left. And the, the stuff that um, people want is, I often find it not very progressive. I find it, you know, not very helpful to the poor, not very, <laughs> not very multicultural a lot of the time. Uh, it's it's it seems just completely foreign to me. So yeah, that's why I described it as kind of an invading force. I'm gonna tell you, tell you a story. It's you know rel relatively true story. Um, <laughs> so I, I decided to run for president. I remember that. Yeah, um, uh, on universal basic income, which is give everyone a thousand bucks a month. And I thought I'd be left of Bernie uh -huh. beca because it's like well even Bernie stopped short of just being like let's give everyone money. By the way, I was like, you know, after Bernie, the whole freaking campaign to be like, hey, Bernie, and like, like get on board. Uh, and then Bernie came out for a federal jobs guarantee, and I was like, oh, it's like not really the, 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 the that's not, <laughs> that's not the think answer, the, 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 the way. Um, um, but the left did not respond positively to universal basic income uh, initially. Like and I was attacked as I don't know like anti uh, anti welfare like a libertarian Trojan horse right like a, a bunch of things and I was like bewildered by it and I was like guys you do realize I'm like trying to like just <laughs> give everyone a thousand bucks a month I mean last I checked that would be quite good for people who don't have a thousand bucks I mean like it seems like a win seems like a left wing policy seems relatively left aligned yeah. And, and I Do made you think it was because you was... didn't wear the socialist label? Do you think that's that's why they didn't go for that? Well, well, that, this, this is a part of it. It's like that I had an identity, and and more what I've yeah. included, Jeff, is that it's more like I had an attitude and an energy that didn't line up with like the the general school of thought. Yeah. Um, because like I'm a positive, can-do guy, and like I talk about the evolution of capitalism, um, and the case I was making for universal basic income, which I totally believe, mm -hmm. um, was that look, this is like a um, this is good for market economies that people have money to spend. It's like good mm -hmm. for small businesses. Like you know, like you, you. This is just a better functioning system, um, and uh, and so I was trying to make this argument to people uh, at every point in the, um, you know, like sort of political uh, scale or leaning, um, and I, you know, I did say it's like look, like there were libertarian thinkers who like liked versions of this, mm -hmm. and, and uh, you know, it's like Nixon came this close to passing a version of this. And then, like, I figured the left, frankly, would take care of itself. 
Um, <laughs> well, I was wrong on that <laughs> because then they, like it was being like uh, attacked in various ways. It was only after months and months passed where eventually uh, a bunch of folks on the left started using universal basic income as something they were calling for. Yeah, it's bizarre. The one that kills me these days is uh, universal student loan forgiveness, which some people are calling for. I think some student loan forgiveness makes sense. I had a, actually had a piece in the New York Times about how I think the thing the thing I hope people know about universal forgiveness is that it's regressive. If you're re, if you're forgiving literally every penny to everybody. So so thirty five percent of Americans have college degrees. So uh, if you were to try and find the bottom fifty percent of the population. I'm going to say majority of them probably do not have do college not have degrees. Well, I, I actually, I know this number because I just wrote about it. 87% of Americans don't have any student debt. So I feel like right away, when you're talking about student debt, you're talking about something that basically means nothing to 87% of the country. I mean, it's true. You know, it's like, yeah, some maybe you don't, but your child does. This, but yeah, yeah, yeah right. Cetera, but cetera. but um, it, it, so, and again, I've written about this also on my blog. It just, you, and let me qualify again, universal forgiveness. I'm for some forgiveness, but universal forgiveness would be regressive. So I feel like I'm to the left and I'm arguing with people who think they are to my left, but I think they're wrong. I think they're to my right. And it's it's just bizarre to have these conversations where like, you know, it, I mean, you know, of course, when I did the New York Times piece, you know, Twitter called me like a, a you know, Wall Street bro. I'm like, you you so don't fucking know who you're talking about. <laughs> or for the EPA. <laughs> or for the EPA. Heal the earth. I was like, the Peace Corps, the Lord. EPA. It's not, it's like, you know, do your research. But, um, and I really strongly feel like, no, I'm to the left on this, you idiot. Uh, you know? Did you see the uh, Ryan Grimm piece uh, in The Intercept uh, came out this week? I didn't, no. Um, I will summarize it for you. It was called The Elephant in the Zoom. And it's a it's like why DC progressive um, organizations have devolved into internal conflict. Oh, wait, yes, I did see that. Yes, I did see that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That was, that was quite good. So, so there, there's something happening, man, where... People are now waking up to the fact that it's like, uh, wait a minute, <laughs> like, like, like that. this, this stuff isn't actually what it purports to be. It's not good for organizations. It's not good for individuals. Um, have, have you read uh, Woke Racism by John McWhorter? I'm like quizzing you on this. Oh, I love John McWhorter. I've not read that book, but I, I certainly know because I heard him on a thousand podcasts. Yeah, I know yeah, the argument course. that he makes in it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So so that was one of the best summaries. I mean, when you call the religious left, I mean, he calls it essentially the same. Yeah, thing. yeah. I, no, I'm very much in tune with him on that. Question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so you, um, but that there's been this um, awakening to the fact that these, and by the way, so I ran a nonprofit. Um, and when you talk about the the folks who join comedy writers rooms as like a particular background, when you look at folks who join, I'm get I'm very confident like DC area or New York area nonprofits like mm -hmm. you know did they go to college? Check. Did they go mm -hmm. to tend to go to college East Coast? Check. Like yeah. and, and then and it's like did, if you join a nonprofit, are you driven by certain um, uh, goals and ideas which mm -hmm. t tend to make you line up with? Um, like uh, like a certain orientation, totally. Yeah. Um, and so, by the way, there's also true of media, which is like another yep. uh, yep. uh, another problem. From what I know of media, yeah. Yeah. So so that that also the Democratic uh, Party. Let me add. Oh yeah. Same a, same type of thing. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, it's true. Political activism. And then someone came out and said, I mean, like one of the, you know, like the the. Um, Examples of this is like the entire Latinx thing. I mean, like you know, it's like yeah. literally two percent of people like it and sixty percent hate it. And you're like, you know, like, <laughs> you're like, oh, this is a winner. It's like winner four. Yeah, you know, winning that, elections that clearly not for that two percent of people. You know, for like your it. sense of you know righteousness, yeah, it's a winner for that. It's like, yeah, you know, right. Like you know, it's gonna you're gonna righteous us all the way to authoritarianism in a hot minute. <laughs> it's it's yeah. like the it, it is the um, the the sense, but uh, you know, so I see more and more. Stuff where people are like, okay, and but uh, the the story I was trying to get to is that um, people I know who ran nonprofits mm -hmm. like lived in fear of their own staff, yep, uh, because the the staff was going to <laughs> to uh, you know pillory them for some lapse of mm -hmm. uh, you know like beliefs. Yeah, look at the Washington Post last week. They're worried of that, right? 
the yeah. Felicia Somnes thing? I don't totally. Know you, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah no, right, I'm, yeah. I'm totally up on that. Okay. Um, and watching that unfold publicly was, you know, painful for all of us. So I sense that you were kind of entertained <laughs> by it I, from what I saw. I was very entertained by it. I, I, I wrote a piece about how entertained by it I was. Yeah, it was hilarious. I mean, I got no skin in that game. It was just hilarious to watch somebody burn their organization to the ground on Twitter for a week and they can't fucking do anything about it. And the organization is the Washington Post and they finally got around to firing her. Firing her. <laughs> Dude, I think I, it had I to don't... be a legal thing. I don't know if you saw after that, like I, I was reflecting on it and like I didn't wade in on that and on Twitter because it's like, ah, it's like not my thing. And like I, I try very, very hard not to, not to um, like frankly get bogged down in like the, the kind of media spats and Twitter back and forth. Like mm -hmm. I think that's a path to unproductivity and, and um, insanity. Know, insanity. Yeah. Um, but I did reflect for a moment on what I thought the real problem was of the fix. And so I said, like, hey, you know, you should just get all journalists off Twitter. It'd be a win for the journalists and, and a win for uh, the public. I've been and, wondering about this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then I proceeded to be like, look, like, this stuff's just, like, you know, like, putting our journalists in, like, this weird, like, like um, bubble. And, like, you know, they seek affirmation in a particular way. And it's, like, making them more ideological and, like, probably makes them unhappy and... <laughs> like uh, there's a bunch of things and it was clearly like a thought experiment on my part but it's driven by the Washington Post thing yeah. because like watching adults trash each other and their organization uh, like publicly was just like you know I mean this is just it's, like a it's not good and it's the Washington Post which has to be credible you have to be a credible serious organization populated by adults or else your product is not one anyone's gonna want to buy and they did not look like that. <laughs>so uh, I put out a Twitter poll yesterday I'm like just talking about my own tweet so sorry everyone but uh, <laughs> but uh, but it was like who do you trust the most category one politicians category two comedians includes you my friend ah uh, can uh, we win because of me category number three when people think comedian they think Jeff Maurer <laughs> yeah <that's> clearly <laughs> um, uh, and then category number three journalists what do you think the percentages are uh, how about comedians 50 no 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 probably comedians higher than that because, the, again, the other two are journalists and politicians. I'm going to say comedians, 70. Uh, journalists, 20. Politicians, 10. 83. Ah, shit. 15. Two. <laughs> two. Boy. It was like, it was I mean, it was, it was so extreme, it was ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, and, and so one of the things I've been struggling with a little bit in my own life, Jeff, is mm -hmm. that, that like there are times where I have thoughts that are somewhat inappropriate. I find them to be funny. <laughs> Occasionally, sure. I'll tweet something, and then you know, sometimes I get a hot water, and I'm just like, "Oh, come on, like, come on, you know, I'm just fucking around." Mm -hmm. So, so one of the things I'm I'm um, um, thinking about is uh, trying to be be frankly like just like a humorous figure more deliberately, because like now it's like I've been like a political uh, figure. Um, for not that long, really. I mean, like, I, I, maybe four years. Are you saying you have a packet you want me to hand on to John Oliver? Is that where this is headed? Yeah, yeah, I, I want to get that right. <laughs> You've got a page full of jokes. A page full of jokes. Well, so, but I, I was imagining what people need, and your blog is an approach to this, where you're like, look, I'm going to deliver it to you. It's going to be funny. And his blog is quite funny, everyone. I might be wrong. It's funny. Um, but, there, but there are serious ideas in there. Um, and so you think that in order to get people to, to consider politics, you need what you called like some sugar? Yeah, the, the sugar that helps the medicine go down. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, and, and so this is one Which of the problems. Which is also what last week tonight is. I mean, and, you know. and, and America, yeah, right. And it's one reason why, again, 83% choose comedians as the people they trust and then journalists like you know, 15 <laughs> and the rest. Yeah. So because there's a sense that comedians are telling us the truth. Um, journalists are presenting something, but we can sense that it's skewing in particular directions. And, and by the way, this is one thing that the parties are sharply divided on. It's one reason why, you know, like uh, I'm, I'm doing what I'm doing. So 69% uh, of self-described um, liberals, Democrats, et cetera, have high trust in media. Mm -hmm. um, independents, it's 39%. Okay. And then, and then Republicans, it's 15%. Okay. So Republicans are like, fuck this. Liberals, like, 
you know, lying to us, bullshit. Yeah. But, you know, now obviously there are some Lame elements media. of that that are like really, like, frankly, you know, dark and like they, they you know, become prone to misinformation, conspiracy theories, yeah, a bunch sure. of other things. Um, but like the the Democrats are kind of like the last of like the people that trust <laughs> yeah, <laughs> in, a, yeah. in, in a particular way. But more and more of the populations like we question, we we don't trust. Um, and then you you have both politicians and journalists represent this establishment that people are losing faith in. Mm -hmm. um, and then comedians are given license to poke fun at the establishment. Right. Um, and we we say we laugh, but we're also like, yeah, that 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 shit is right. Part of what you just said that uh, worried me a little is that people think comedians are telling them the truth, <laughs> which certainly sometimes they are. You lied to us, Jeff. I, no, <laughs> not me. No, 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 no. That one time no, no. on that stage <laughs> in D.C., that story wasn't. He did not just fly in from Cleveland and his arms are not tired. <laughs> no, I. Uh, sometimes they're telling the truth, but it's, it's like anything else. People should remember, you know, comedy, like it's still media. Like they're still trying to get eyeballs. So... Yeah, sometimes it's very truthful, but I wouldn't assume all the time. I mean, for Christ's <laughs> sake, be discerning. Fact um, check those comedians. No, seriously, yes. Fact check the comedians. But, um, yeah, I don't know. It's Institutional trust is such a weird thing for me because I've been such an institutional guy for so long. I was at EPA for nine years. So, like, during COVID, every time the CDC or the FDA would do something to undermine their credibility, I would just lose my mind. I, I'd be apoplectic because it's like that. that is your most valuable asset. That is the thing you cannot do is lose people's trust. And I think, you know, the thing, you know, for example, in the early days when they said, uh, oh, you know, and uh, the, the masks don't do much. And then later they admitted, well, it was, we were kind of saying that because we were worried that there'd be a run on masks. And I understand why they made that decision, and yet I think it was the Just wrong tell decision. tell us the fucking they, truth, Tell man. us the truth, because you undermined your credibility so badly. And again, I understand, like, how that thought process happened, but your credibility is your most valuable asset. So that type of decision is one that me, as a longtime institutional guy, is like, no, no, you really blew that. Me, as a longtime fan of the Washington Post, <laughs> thinks, like, you have got to get your credibility back. You've got to stop publicly beclowning yourself. And I think slowly people are getting that. I think so. So the institutional trust, and as someone who's looked at the numbers, and you probably have looked at them too, Gallup, et cetera, uh, they're all um, they're not good. Yeah, yeah, they're all quite low. Uh, uh, you know, uh, think public approval of Congress and trust in Congress is down to like what nineteen percent, something really, really low. Yeah, uh, presidency is underwater, below fifty percent. Um, in the most trusted institutions in American life, guess. Oh God, uh, hot dog carts. In strip clubs, U.S. military, okay, and uh, town libraries, law enforcement still pretty high. Town up. libraries, yeah, people trust librarians. <laughs> okay, <laughs> <laughs> uh, not sure what to do with that. Um, but you look at other schools <laughs> down, hospitals down. How media much power down. are librarians and trust? I'm oh, sorry, go well, ahead. Apparently, we should give them more power. I mean, okay. it's one of my, I guess. my ideas. You know, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead. So trust is down except for in the libraries. Yeah, but well, mi military too. I mean, which, by, by the way, is probably like uh, you know foreshadowing for where the country is going to wind up. Um, oh God, I hope uh, not. Um, I mean, you know, probably. Um, so, uh, I mean, Ray Dalio, when I, I, you know, like biggest hedge fund uh, founder in the world, uh, you know, runs two hundred billion dollars. Put the odds of a civil war. Uh, in the U.S. for the next 10 years at 30% in his book. And then Jeez, in conversation... I take that bet. Is he taking bets? And then in conversation, he was like, it's, it's higher than 30% now. He's like, I wrote that 18 months ago, so it's higher now. Um, so that, that you're, so when I talk, it's like, oh, you know, these people trust the military. Like, you know, maybe at some point the military is going to step in and do some things. Seems, um, I hear people talk about this. Boy, I would take that bet. That seems incredibly unlikely to me. Um, I, you know, I mean, certainly hope you're right. You know, like, uh, so I, I'm on the, but I'm on like the, hey, we should really be trying to refresh and modernize and invigorate um, some of these institutional arrangements 
um, because yeah, yeah. the two-party system in particular, it has at us at each other's throats. And when you talk about like that, these far folks on what you call the religious left, it's like the, the problem is they're whipsawing major institutions that mm -hmm. then represent, you know, like the Democratic Party to like other people. And then it's very easy to just point at them and be like, look, guys, you really want these people in charge? And then there yeah. are folks in the Democratic Party is like, no, that's not me. Yes. Uh, you know, and then the same thing happens in reverse, which is like if you look at the you know, looniest Republicans. I mean, it's it's mm -hmm. very very dark, and so then Democrats like you don't want them them in charge. I mean, yeah. like like the Democratic Party should be at least two separate parties by now. Uh, <laughs> then the Republican Party should be two separate parties by now. Yeah, and then you'd have like a fifth party in the middle, and then this would be sane. You'd, if, you'd have if like if we were Europe, that's probably what it would be. Yeah, or you know, but so right now we're careening towards uh, you know something of a disaster. Um, so one of the things that, that is happening too is that the, the Democratic Party doesn't have much of the sugar you're describing in terms of humor. There's like it's a real humorless. Yeah, we are not. Yeah, yeah, we are not seen as uh, super, <laughs> super funny right now. We're not the good time party right now. No, no, it's a problem. Very much not. It's a problem. I mean, if there's an operative emotion coming out of the Democratic Party right now, it's fear, uh, and and then and you can't use fear to to motivate people ad infinitum. Like at some point, people just check out. You know what I mean? I think one thing that's disappointing is that the people that we're all thinking of, you know, the really humorless people on Twitter, where, as you said, like, sometimes you want to say something and you think, oh, shit, I'm going to, I'm going to hear from somebody about that. It's like, I don't even, I don't even know how that's offensive, but somebody will figure out some way that's offensive and find some way. And I just don't want to deal with that. <laughs> I, I still feel like, I feel like one thing Twitter does is bring you in touch with that person. Whereas before they were out there, you just didn't know they were out there. You didn't hear from no, them. I know. I'm going to say this much, much worse, man. Like that person exists because of Twitter. That person, if Twitter doesn't exist, that person is not sitting there being like, I'm going to do it. Yeah. Like, because there's no actual, uh, you know, um, positive reinforcement for them. Yeah. It's like, like if someone said something that they didn't like and there was no Twitter, then they can't yeah. get to that person. Uh, and then they're just living their life being like, whatever. I think you're probably right about that. Uh, I, I mean, certainly Twitter, like Twitter has a culture. Twitter has it's just, there's just something about the like format of Twitter that lends itself to dunks. It's like all about the dunks. People just sitting around waiting for somebody to dunk on. And so, yeah, I, I think you're right that it's uh, it's more acerbic. It's more hostile than maybe people used to be. Nonetheless, I still think the number of people who are actually like that is still relatively small. They're just really loud. Oh, yeah. So there are numbers for this, man. Numbers for everything. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, I forgot how data-driven your world is. Yeah, yeah. That, okay. So um, there are approximately 15% of people who fall into to what you'd consider like a far-left progressive camp, and then there's like a subset of them that are in what, what you'd consider this, uh, you know, religious mm -hmm. kind of group. But they're very, very loud on Twitter. Yeah. Um, so so I, I'm... Looking at ways, I've written three books, one of which was before I was, you know, like anybody, and so it sold a few copies, and I was like, fine with that. <laughs> and then, actually, I'll tell you a story that is pretty funny. So, write a book, um, you know, sell, sell some copies, and then I go to my agent, and, you know, I'm like one of his, like, you know, smallest, like, you know, um, authors, and I'm like, hey, I'm, I'm writing a book, uh, and I'm going to run for president on it. Um, you know, but it's going about fiction. automation. So, <laughs> yeah. So make that work. And, and so he's like, okay. So uh, we write this proposal, and it's like, hey, Andrew Yang is going to run for president, universal basic income, the book's about automation, da da da. Mm -hmm. And then the, the publishers all are like, you know, frankly, just being like, like, I've seen some proposals that like make claims before, but like, no one takes the entire like, run for president, <laughs> like, et cetera thing, seriously. Yeah. And so then my agent later would like, I, I, um, I'm on the debate stage with like Elizabeth Warren and they ask like, what gift do you want to give? And I'm like, I'd give Elizabeth Warren a copy of my book. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I come off stage and then my, my team's like, Hey, by the way, you're like books like trending and like now ah. everyone's like buying it. And so then my agent calls me and is like, uh, like your book proposal like it is like the was the most far out thing that I've ever seen come true in like my, my <laughs> years as an agent because we were like you're gonna do this thing so 
Um, so that book is now sold like 175, 180,000 copies, which is a lot for a book, um, but still isn't reaching people in, in certain ways. So I'm like looking for different ways to try and frame um, some of these messages, and I'm becoming increasingly convinced that humor is a path. Oh yeah. Um, so that so it's it's one of the things I'm I'm now especially with this now like we trust comedians more <laughs> like and 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 the rest of it. I'm looking at it well, and, and the humorlessness that's coming out of our politics right now. Yeah, the the humorlessness is a real bad look and it's a real big problem, and I I hope people are figuring out that it's a big problem. And <laughs> Trump was funny. Trump was funny. Wow, you said and, it. Yeah. Trump was funny, and I don't I don't mean the jokes about Trump, w which I spent many years writing to the point that I wanted to you know throw myself off a bridge. I don't mean those were funny. I mean Trump himself. He's he's he's, he's a performer. He's a performer. Yes, and it's like it's all very dark. It's all real bad stuff. But like he's entertaining, and you would see him at those rallies that were you know when he was really getting momentum in like late 2015 and 2016. It's like. He's basically doing stand-up. Yes. And we always said in the Last Week Tonight writer's room, he's doing this, because I was not the only stand-up there. He's doing this like a stand-up. Yeah. And that he is going out and he's seeing what lines hit. And then if they hit, it's like Drain the Swamp. Who saw Drain the Swamp coming? And what the fuck was he talking about? Nobody ever knew, including him. But like Drain the Swamp hit. So then you just got dra Drain the Swamp all the time. By the way, Drain the Swamp's a very powerful idea because no offense to you know your former town or whatnot but you know i mean the swamp i, cur I currently live in dc oh really yeah well, your current town then the yeah. swamp's pretty swampy man <laughs> well yeah so, I mean, sometimes but yes and, but is donald trump the person oh, no, to of, course, drive? of course not he's the opposite oh, but, but, by the way i had the same process because like i was marching around the country in okay. 2018 we did the humanity first tour and like you know very small thank you everyone who showed up there weren't many of you so if you were there you know uh, um and and so for me it was uh uh, opposite of of Trump's an Asian guy who likes math um, became an applause line, and then from that math became uh, make America think harder, and then became like this symbol. I think it's a math hat behind me on the 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 shelf, and so we sold three million dollars worth of math hats, and uh, you know like the. Did you really? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So it was. So yours. So it's mostly a merch operation. Is no, what you're no. <laughs> I mean, we we sold. And, I a, mean, book, we and raised, a book tour. <laughs> we raised forty million dollars. So I mean, you know, three mil is only like whatever, like eight eight percent of that. Okay. So, um, you got money from Sam B, right? We got money, Sam. Do you remember that, Sam Beckman? Th oh, this is funny. Oh, this is funny. Samantha B. You got oh, Samantha B. Give Samantha us money. B. Thank you, Samantha B. Yeah, oh, okay. yeah. We we won that competition. <laughs> yes. Very grateful. <laughs> it was awesome. But you no, know, we, I mean, we raised forty million dollars from uh, like something like four hundred twenty-five thousand uh, Americans in increments. Like the average, like the median donation was very low. It was like you know, like. 27 30 bucks something like that so um there was a quarter that i raised half of what bernie raised and i was running around yelling we're half a bernie we're half a bernie but it was like very very wholesome grassroots uh funded campaign and then the merch became a part of that but our process was the same as trump's where we were going to live crowds and so this is one of the problems is that you have most uh politicians where they have a stump I've seen them give their fucking stump a million times. Like, like one of the jokes I have in my book is like, you just have us all give each other stumps because we've all seen it fucking so many times. And then I I'd joke, it's like I would actually pay to see like, uh, you know, Bernie stand up there and, and do the yang, which is like, hey, the robots are coming. We're, we're doomed to give everyone a thousand bucks. You know, it'd be pretty funny. Um, but Trump was a performer. Trump mm -hmm. was humorous, he had a particular energy, and he captured, harnessed this anti-institutional energy that on the Republican side is much, much stronger. Yeah. Um, so they overran the traditional Republican candidates. He's gonna do it again in 24 if he runs, in my opinion, which I think he will. So I, I think he, he winds up the Republican nom nominee. I'm gonna disagree with you there, but but I, th I think which he's part gonna run. I don't think he's gonna win. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's my hot take. I think he's gonna run and lose. To who? DeSantis. Okay, if, if DeSantis <laughs> runs, then it's a death match, it's competitive, and uh, like it's anyone's game. Do you think DeSantis is not gonna run? I don't think DeSantis runs. Really? No. Okay. I think he's I think he's gonna run and I think but we've been talking about this in terms of entertainment, right? Talking about Trump and like, ah man, the Trump show. In twenty fifteen, people are very into the Trump show. Yeah. I think people are tired of that show. Yeah, I, I think that's one of the big factors. That and and Ukraine, Ukraine's not gonna because all the Russia stuff's gonna come back up and it looks very salient right now. And well, so, uh, I, people, to, I think people are tired of that show. Oh, well, you need a uh, foil. You need an opponent. If DeSantis mm -hmm. runs, I think that it's anyone's game, and I might even favor DeSantis. I do not think DeSantis runs. 
because one heard he was telling donors X months ago, it's been a little while, if Trump runs, he doesn't run. But two mm-hmm. is that if you're uh, self-interested and you're just saying this, it's like, let me do the math. I run against Trump, we have a death match, split the base, massive rancor, you know, some of these people are frankly like not entirely balanced and so there'd, there'd be some folks that are like kind of, you know, like hardcore on one side or another. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe I come out on top, but like, you know, I come out very, very scarred and bruised and with like tons of uh, like people that are like against me still because Trump will have like a strong hold on, on X. Yeah. Or I like wait the cycle. I'm the heir apparent. I'm still in my late 40s. Uh, if Trump wins, then like you know, maybe I end up like vice president. Then I just glide into the uh, White House. Maybe you know, it's like uh, like like I'm. Uh, there's no reason to think my popularity is going to disappear between now and then. It's just if, if you're him, it makes more sense just to cool cool it. If Trump runs mm. the cycle, which I think he does. Maybe I mean you know we'll definitely find out if if Ron DeSantis is not running for president, he's doing a great impression of a guy who is. Oh, because I find his behavior really hard to explain. Well, it, not so running. it's not just him. There are half a dozen people who are running around, like, acting as if they're going to run for president because <laughs> yeah. you kind of have to. Well, you know, you've done it, so I suppose you, you yeah, I do know. Can, can read the tea leaves, right? Um, but <laughs> it's it's politically advantageous for you to do so because it's like you're in this period where people will be like, oh, let me check you out. Like, you might run for president. Mm-hmm. You build relationships with donors. So, like, even if your plan is to run, um, you know, in, in, in 28, if Trump runs, number one, Trump could have a heart attack tomorrow, so then you're on. Um, uh, and then, you know, you're just uh, paving your, your way. Um, it's because there are massive contingencies. So you will operate to your team. It's like, let's freaking act like we're doing this thing. Mm-hmm. But when push comes to shove, if Trump runs, I think he, he sits it out. That's interesting. Well, I'm, for a million reasons, I'm just glad I'm not in Republican politics. I'm glad I don't have to figure that out <laughs> or deal with that guy. And I'm also not a late night comedy writer anymore. So I don't have to deal with Trump in any way, shape or form, which is a blessing. So is Trump's act aging? Yes. Um, but but you need a better act. Yeah. And the, the problem is that uh, if you have any number of mainstream Republicans um, who run against Trump, that's not the act that anyone wants. Like people don't want Chris Christie or Mike Pence <laughs> standing there looking boring being like, oh, you, you know, American do- oh, when, 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 blah, blah, blah. When, when Marco Rubio tried to get Trumpy at the very end when, when his campaign was in the death throes, it was just not a good look for him. It didn't work. Yeah. You can't, when, he, when he was like making fun of his hands and stuff. And tr- you remember that? Yeah, I do. Very, I do. At the very, very, very so. end of his campaign. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's like you can't just flip a switch and suddenly be Trump. So, so, so this is the, the fundamental problem we're facing. So you have Trump as an act and like, you know, I agree it's getting tired, but there is no other act unless. <laughs> the, the, so, yeah, they're so, hard to come by, yeah. So a sweep. And the, the Democratic Party is like kind of like the fearful last of the institutionalists. Um, and then if someone comes in with it. So when McConaughey, um, you know, did his White House the event, I was like, Matthew McConaughey has presidential qualities. Um, sure. And, well, he's an actor. He's got charisma. Yeah. And, and this is the, the issue, is that in my opinion, um, we need a world-class performer or an act that's benign and positive that can actually uh, counterbalance. So the problem is if you have like Trump in this, you know, messed up act, and then you have like the, these like institutionalists, like the institutionalists are going to lose um, you know, and, and so you, you, you need like another version that has some kind of energy, uh, appeal, like it isn't hitting the same, um, sort of, uh, tut tutting tones. <laughs> yeah, tut tutting is not a good look. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's hard. You need the whole package and that's hard to come by. I mean, Ronald Reagan was an actor. And he had Zelensky is a comedian, you know. It's Zelensky like, is a comedian. That's right. So I want to ask you one of the things that that I ask some of my comedian friends, and we can close out on this. Um, uh, which of your comedian buddies do you think should run for president? <laughs> <laughs> oh, because they'd be good shit. at it. I'm just going to while he's thinking, I'm going to preface this by being like, look, having done this, a comedian, an actor, 
or a professional wrestler would be <laughs> extraordinarily the Rock. The Rock, the Rock. have a lot of success if he ran. The Rock would be great. Have a lot of McConaughey would be great. I, Mark Cuban would be great. I do feel the need to ask the questions like, does The Rock actually know anything about you know foreign policy, economics? The, I don't, the he seems Rock like a can, nice guy. The Rock can have a world class team around him, and and all would oh, be come fine. On. Oh, that's what they said about Trump. That's what they said about Trump. Oh, but Trump, uh, yeah, Trump's like, man, yeah, you know, it's like, uh, no, I'm, not buying, I'm not buying the world class team thing. <laughs> I'm no, not buying that. Fine. McConaughey, I mean, McConaughey seems to have like more. <laughs> uh, you know, I like, I, I think The Rock is. Plenty smart enough to be able to lead us in particular. Like, I, well, I don't know. There's intelligence, what... and then there's knowledge. And, like, I want my president to have knowledge in addition to, in addition to intelligence. So that's a high bar you're setting up. Yeah, there. I, <laughs> it is. You know why? Because it's the goddamn president. <laughs> Dude, to, we're, 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 to, at a, we're at a point now, man, where we're going to get two out of three. You got to get two a, out of three. I had a joke in my act around the time Trump ran that's like, you know, people say, he's like me. You're not supposed to want a president like you. The president is supposed to be a thousand times better than you because it's the goddamn president. So again, comedian, actor, uh, professional wrestler. Um, <laughs> like, uh, like uh, I think that that uh, having done this, they they have a lot of success. And and one of the issues, one of the reasons why, in my opinion, we're we're like being set up to fail, is that if you have someone who has this sort of energy, like you know. Uh, uh, you know, one one person that I'm going to have on the podcast shortly, like uh, Jesse Ventura, who became uh, governor of sure. Minnesota as an independent, had yeah. that so, uh, version of this energy. So the problem is that Democrats look at this person and be like, ha ha, it's a joke. These people don't have and, – and again, it's because they're like the last of the institutional holdouts. Um, and so like the people in the media will like, you know, like dismiss the McConaughey's of the world or like whatever the hell it is. Um, the – so – um, but having, you know, again, been through, um, uh, this arc, like I, I can see why the, these people would excel. A and then sure. the question is whether the media actually piles in behind them. Um, so Obama, like when you look at it, like Obama was an excellent performer. Now mm -hmm. he was an intellect. Well, he he, 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 he was one of, of the few who was the whole package. Yeah. He, he had the brains, he had the knowledge and he was charismatic. Yep. Yeah. And he had a great bio. He was the whole package, yeah. And, yeah, and he doesn't come along every day. So, so one of, one of the things I'm going to suggest to everyone is like, look, at this point, our politicians have become performers. We should just acknowledge that and just find like some fucking awesome performers. <laughs> um, so, with that as my my opportunity for you to uh, reflect, who's who's it going to be? I'm Jeff, gonna, I'm going to give an answer. You know, it's going to be a, it's going to be a, it's going to be a slight cheat, but I don't think that makes it any less interesting. Al Franken, Al Franken, let's not a bad choice. Let's, let's reopen that case. Because we know more about what happened, and um, I think we should reopen that case. We should definitely reopen that case, um, generally. Uh, you know, I know a half dozen people who were uh, canceled, lost their jobs, like, you know, lost their livelihood over stuff that now we're like, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he's, and he's one of them. I was on that list. Yeah. Um, and he, and he, he, he's a knowledgeable guy. He's a knowledgeable guy. Do you know guy. Al? He's just, no, never met him. Never met him. But of course, I like him very much because he. I, first of all, Al, he's funny. He's funny. He, he's smart. He's funny. He, he's funny, um, and he's been I, funny. So I, I, I was on his podcast, so I, I have okay. that contact with him. Um, it's funny. It's like you know, well, like podcast bros. Um, <laughs> but, uh, um, but that, that's a fine response. I'll take it. Well, thanks. The the, the other uh, popular figures that um, to to that when I pose it, John Stewart. Sure. So we've been uh, hearing that for decades. And then uh, another one too that has come up that uh, you know I've I've, I've been um, you know late night uh, out with him and I'm I'm like 100 percent certain that this will never happen. Uh, Dave Chappelle. Dave Chappelle. Sure. Yeah. So Dave Dave's like. Psh. <laughs> like, like his, um, he's got Dave, other priorities. Yeah. No. No. Dave, 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 Dave's like. You, you know, know, if you win, you have to do it. You, you know, you have to. It's a grind. And uh, you really got to want it to sign up for that specific gig. I agree that, you know, yeah, you need somebody with charisma who, you know, you didn't do that badly. But you need somebody who, who uh, is, has the charisma, but the, I, I, I got to go back to the chops. So I'm not, I, I'm not into the idea of, you know, finding, finding an actor and then just be like, well, we'll just coach him up. We'll give him, you know, Econ 101 and then that'll uh, 
give them the knowledge they need to, you know, for example, like right now we have a very tricky problem involving inflation. Well, but but here's, like, here's the thing I'm going to say, man, is we had like establishment people in there and it didn't prevent it from happening. You know what I mean? It's like, like you, you, you have this kind of like the, the this thing where, you know, it's like the JFK, establishment, establishment. smartest people I'm in the saying... room, et cetera, et cetera. It's like you have people, you know, like our, our establishment at this point has become great at apologizing after the fact and then, you know, like t taking in, I, like the institutional mistrust that's built up. I feel like we had the experiment with the anti-institutionalists, the people who are kind of making the argument that you're making right now with like, oh, they don't fucking know anything with Trump. And that's what Trump was. And he shit the bed on so many things. I mean, it looks like we're finally going to reduce Dude, tariffs. No, there's, there's no like Trump, Trump defense Trump didn't know what here. he's doing with the tariffs. There's no Trump okay. defense here. Uh, but but, I, but, but the, the, yeah. the thing that, so here's what, what's happening is that you have these institutions that are, you know, fumbling, failing. Sometimes they're great. Sometimes they're like really not great. But even when they're not great, it's not like anyone really raised their hand and is like, hey guys, our bad. Like, you know, like th there's like zero like uh, accountability. Accountability or acknowledgement even or any kind of revamping it's just like you know especially in this day and age because we're so polarized that they can just be like hey you know like to our people it's like we good they bad um and then you have this like force outside being like getting bigger and bigger being like oh like you know where we we don't like what's happening and so it, if you just play the institutionalist game like this force just keeps going up this keeps going down and then you lose cataclysmically um the the only way out is to try and actually come clean and being like look some of these institutions you know, I've gotten a bad rap. Some of them genuinely not that good. Um, but we need to revamp them meaningfully. We need to revamp our political system. So we have yeah. five parties instead of two. We have to like I, – and, and the, the problem is that the existing systems will never do more than what we're describing right now, which is that they, they will be here being like, no, we didn't really screw up so bad. It's not so bad. <laughs> and then like more and more. I mean like you talk about inflation. Like the average American right now is just like fuck this shit. Um, you know, my gas is five bucks plus and like da 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 like that, you know, uh, and and like that they're not going to be able to see past this. Um, now we can like you think, Matthew, blame. you think Matthew McConaughey is the guy to fix all this? I think that we need someone who's going to. He's going to come in with a broom and or clean he, up shop. He, he'd be able to communicate. He seems like a nice guy. He's a good actor. He'd be able to, to, to communicate to the American people in a different way. He'd be able to, to approach institutional dysfunction in a different way. Mm -hmm. You could have people that might genuinely make some changes like in a, in a, in like a, a real way. Um, like we're going to need a realignment of some kind like that to get out of this mess. Because like the holding action that's losing is just going to keep losing more ground incrementally. And, and the audience that's going to respond to it is just going to shrink and shrink. It's like the average person out there is just like checking out more and more. Uh, and... You know, and, and like, and that, like, that the only way out is to get them to check back in to something positive, something new, and then you need like someone who can get to them in a different way, because you you have like the traditional media, and that audience is going to shrink and shrink, and like you know, and, and the trust go down and down. You have people like you, who like I, I think are awesome, who are like independent journalists who. Uh, you know, not that you consider yourself a journalist. I don't no, know. no, not a journalist. Yeah, no. yeah. You know what I mean. You're, that's <laughs> I why he's in the eighty-three percent high trust comedian <laughs> that's, that's zone, that's not right. in the fifty yeah, percent. If I, if I started calling myself a journalist, my trust would go but, down. But but yeah. they're like independent voices. Yeah. Uh, and, and like what we need is there are a lot of independent voices right now that I think are very very positive, um, and uh, and we we need the independent um, figures voices to actually have a shot at any kind of. Uh, and, and by the way, the people who are like super pissed off and coming up on this side, they might see like a Matthew McConaughey figure and be like, okay, like I, and there are millions of Americans in this ca category. I signed on to Trump because I wanted to stick a thumb in the eye of the establishment. That's it. Like, you know, yep. uh, and Matthew McConaughey also like fulfills my desire to stick a thumb in the eye of the establishment. <laughs> sure. But he's just not a raging lunatic or like, you know, like an asshole. I think, I think we're talking about trust here, aren't we? We're talking about trust. People want a candidate they feel they can trust. If somebody feels like a creature of an institution coming out of some some institutional body that maybe you don't trust, you don't think very highly of, or you think they represent that institution in some way, they're going to have trouble getting your trust. Like, I understand that. And even if they're a and, good person, if they get wrapped within this cocoon yeah. of, of like, uh, you know, political consultants and media sure, and the rest, yeah, and they, they start talking like a robot, and yeah. then they go out there and they just start, like, doing the same... Yeah, it could be. But 
we're, we're talking about trust and including institutional trust. And of course, any institution is only as trustworthy as the people who are in it. I agree. I agree that first, I agree that people in the institutions are not always doing a great job of earning people's trust. And that's a goddamn shame. And that is something I write about all the time on my blog. And I've said it on this podcast, people in the institutions need to realize their credibility is their main asset and they need to protect that with their lives. Um, librarians I save us. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> librarians. I, I still feel their skill set might be somewhat limited, but yeah, sure, librarians, fine. They, I, I simply don't want to denigrate the idea of expertise. I think expertise is still important. I think knowledge is still important. I love expertise and knowledge. Okay, well, then we're on the same page there. So please do check out Jeff's blog. I might be wrong. Hey, Andrew Yang agrees. I also might be wrong. We all might be wrong. <laughs> we Only all might be wrong. <laughs> and uh, thank you, Jeff, for, for being here and uh, hopefully giving people a little bit of uh, an, an insight into how media is made and how the heck someone becomes a professional comedian. Yeah, go work for the EPA for nine years. It works every time. Every time. Look at that. It's an <laughs> army of comics coming out of that office. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for having me.